This is part four of my battles series. In this case, I depart from the 20th century and will now cover a Napoleonic battle. In this case, the Battle of Maringo, which occurred on the 14th of June, 1800. As with all my battle series, this is not designed as a historical video. There are lots more better historical videos available on YouTube if you want to know about the details of the battle. Instead, this is designed to assist players in creating scenarios of actual battles. As a result, my emphasis is on the units, what they did in the battle, and uh, when they did what they did on the battle, rather than any in-depth analysis of why General X did whatever he was supposed to have done or done not. In this map, we can see the location of Marengo, which is where the battle occurred. In simple terms, the Austrians were at Genoa, when Napoleon drove down from Switzerland and blocked the Austrian line of com com communication with Vienna, basically encircling the Austrians. Marengo was the Austrians' attempt to break out of this encirclement. If we go back to April, this map shows the situation in late April. The main takeaway here was the bulk of the forces were in Germany, and it was expected, or at least the Austrians expected, that the main fight or the strategic point of the conflict during this war was going to be there. Napoleon surprised the Austrians by driving down into Italy. Once Napoleon drove down and took Milan and had cut off the Austrians army from Vienna, he scattered his army to ensure the Austrian army remained trapped. This actually uh, disfused his army which gave the Austrians their opportunity. Napoleon did not expect the main Austrian army to be located in Marengo, but it was and he was going to get a major surprise as a result, a rare failure by Napoleon, one that he did not repeat in his later campaigns which resulted in Auschwitz. I also suspect this may have been due to a rare bit of Austrian initiative as well. The French army which was involved at Marengo is listed here. Napoleon had five corps, one which was a cavalry corps. Only three corps were initially involved, with Berthier arriving in time to stop a disaster, but which still resulted in a retreat by the French. In the second part of the battle, the last corps was involved, and this gave the French the critical advantage which allowed them to finally defeat the Austrians at the end of the same day. This shows the five corps which were involved and which I use in my maps. I should possibly consider breaking this down to a divisional level breakdown, but I lack sufficient information about the location of exactly all the divisions, so I'll keep it at a core level in order to remain comparatively accurate. At this time in the war, the Austrians did not actually use corps, but they did employ a column system, basically, which was an ad hoc collection of formations called a column or some equivalent and given a commander which I suppose is about as close to a corps as we're going to get in 1800. There were four corps size formations involved of which Melas commanded the largest. Melas was also the CNC so in reality um, Melas was commanding his army more at a divisional level with two columns, one on each flank or three columns actually which is a bit of a messy system and possibly one of the reasons why Napoleon did so well at the early period of the war, because his corps system was superior. This shows the, uh, the Austrian corps or columns. Um, and again, as I indicated before, I should really break this down to divisional level. And I actually do have a better idea of where Melas's divisions were actually located during the battle. So, once again, I may come back and redo this video at a divisional level, or at least a mixed divisional core level. The Austrian troops advanced from Alessandria eastward across the Bormida River by two, or using two bridges, debouching in a narrow bend of the river, the river being not easily crossed elsewhere. Poor Austrian staff work prevented any rapid development of their attack and the entire army had to file through a narrow bridgehead. The movement began about 6am with the first shots fired about 8am but the attack was not fully developed until 9am. 
If the Austrians had moved far more rapidly, they would have actually been able to overwhelm the French First Corps under Victor and Murat. Starting with the right flank up until 1000 hours, the 1200 man Austrian advance guard under Fremen and a division of 3300 men under O'Reilly pushed the French outpost back and deployed to become the Austrian right wing, driving the enemy from their initial positions and then heading further south. In the Austrian centre up until 1000 hours, which consisted of about 18,000 men under Melas, this advanced towards Marengo until halted by a Gardenese French infantry, which was deployed in front of the Fontanoine stream. On the Austrian left, 7,500 men under Pieter Otz waited for the road to clear before heading for the village of castel ser well to the north of the French positions. This move threatened either an envelopment of the French right or a further advance to cut, cut the French line of communication with Milan and represented a significant threat. Victor initially deployed a single division to hold back the Austrians, which gave a good account of themselves, holding up the Austrian deployment for a considerable period of time. When this division was exhausted, Victor pulled it back and committed his second division. The French held Marengo village until about noon, with both flanks in the air. Lannes' corps had deployed on the critical right flank during this period, which managed to eliminate the threat of the entire French position being enveloped by Pietro Otto's. After about four hours of rather intense fighting, at about 1400 hours, Marengo had fallen to the Austrians. The French were at risk of collapsing when Napoleon arrived with the consular guards, which he sent to the critical point in the front line and prevented a total French collapse. After this point, the French withdrew about three kilometres to a group. The Austrians did not pursue particularly aggressively, possibly because most formations had been fighting for four hours, as well as walking or marching for the previous four hours, and possibly because the Austrians thought they had won. Sometime before 1700, the French had managed to regroup and at 1700 launched a counterattack. After an intense fight, the French managed to break the Austrians who started withdrawing, or more accurately, routing. I'm uncertain when this occurred, I assume about 1900 hours. A, a key, fa key factor in the Austrian collapse was the, the new commander in chief being captured or killed. In addition, the French the, managed to deploy their last corps, thus had managed to achieve some level of numerical uh, equivalence or even numerical superiority. The Austrians fell back to Marengo, where a heroic defence allowed half the army to escape, but still with 8,000 taken prisoner. This was a, a reasonably significant defeat of the Austrians, when uh, particularly uh, bitter considering that they had basically assumed they'd already won the battle and they kind of had. If they had pursued more aggressively and if Melas had not decided to go back to his base to write a letter and decided to continue to command the Austrian, that may have been able to hold the position in the second part of the battle and possibly resulted in a marginal Austrian win. But as it was, it was pretty much uh, the signal to almost end the war, although activities up north were also quite critical in ending this particular war. The first step is to look at the armies um, in a manner that is useful for war gamers in order to create a scenario. One interesting observation I made in this battle is that um, I have a spreadsheet um, which allows me to basically... Um, you know, select a set of rules I want to play from WRG to DBN or whatever, and it does all the calculations in terms of points. Um, I fed in all the data in terms of the forces uh, for that were involved in Marengo, and I can get a points mix. Now, the first thing that I noticed were both armies were approximately equivalent in terms of points if their morale was similar. Considering that Napoleon won, um, I would have to assume that either the French had higher morale or the commander had higher morale. So, you know, the one initial takeaway that I have to take from this is that 
the French did have significant qualitative advantage over the Austrians in order for them to win, considering that they were pretty much caught flat foot or flat footed. Using the uh, spreadsheet tool which I mentioned earlier, this shows the Austrian forces in figures using a scale of 250 men per figure or 16 guns per figure. If we look at the divisions, they range in strength from 9 to 20 figures. Uh, that's assuming we ignore the advance guard, which is particularly small. This presents a few issues. One is an element is typically four figures, and many of the divisions do not cleanly divide by four. The other issue is the cavalry. Some formations only possesses a single figure of dragoons or hussars. So the question is, how do we create full-size elements using this scale? It's not an easy problem to resolve. Let's look at the French to see if the situation is not as bad. And unfortunately, uh, the situation is pretty much similar, with divisions consisting of from between 12 and 20 infantry figures, as well as quite a few single cavalry figures. The summary is, unless the scale used is, let's say, 50 men per figure or less, a lot of rounding will be required to get your force mix to resemble any kind of reality. This is actually the issue with rules such as Blucher. To reflect something historical, each element, or base, or whatever, or counter in, in those particular rules, will need a unique strength. Now, I must admit, Blucher can achieve this by giving different elements, or bases, or counters, different elan, or strength point values. But I'm uncertain if that is something the Elan system would be used for, as a reduced strength does not result in a reduced frontage in those rules. BBB, or Bloody Big Napoleonic Battle, does something similar as well. However, they use actual figures as strength points, and this is, the design, this is a design feature of the rules, with the base reducing in size when the strength reduces enough. So you could probably achieve these different strengths more accurately in BBB based on, of course, the scale that you're using. One solution that you could adopt is to basically total all the figures in each core and use that to determine the number of elements and then organize standard elements in any manner you wish. So for example, if a core has 17 infantry figures, well, that's going to give you four elements with one left over. Well, you can allocate that one left over to another core or vice versa. This way you get accurate core level strength. I have noticed uh, BBB players doing something similar using uh, their large base system, which basically holds elements in the formation. Although in BBB, uh, in theory, you can actually have individual uh, figures although most of the games I've seen in Napoleonic still uses the four-figure element. In this example, the full element in each core is displayed. For the Austrians, there are major differences in the size of core, which may require finer, further fine-tuning. Incidentally, these elements are based on my earlier um, army list that I showed you, which used a scale ratio of 250 men per infantry or cavalry figure and 18 per artillery. Uh, you can use any other kind of scale you wish and you get something similar or something slightly different. Um, it really depends on the rules that you're using. If we flip over to the core, they used a more standard core structure, but even here some of the formations were unusually small. There are two ways of dealing with this level of variability, which is to give each formation a unique value as occurs in board games, or to use a strength point system, either using markers or using elements, as Blucher possibly can accommodate, and BBNB does. Or finally, ignore, for, ignore formations below core and simply total all the troop types under each core, rounding is required, and let players organise them as they wish, moving elements around until they're comparatively happy. I, prefer, I tend to prefer the latter, but few, in, if any, rules allow this at this scale. I did notice that um, bloody big Napoleonic battles, you can actually achieve something like this if you don't use their big bases. That is, you basically duplicate their big bases by assembling, let's say, 15 mil elements together to simulate your big base. 
you can do it there and of course the set of rules that I'm writing you can certainly do it there which is the main reason why I'm writing a set of rules in order to fulfill that particular requirement. For something like DBN I'm not sure if DBN really um, lends itself to recreating historical conflicts as we'll see later. Okay the next question I want to raise and solve is what kind of game do you wish? Games can be generally grouped into historically complex and detailed, such as if you used a low-scale set of rules, such as WRG or equivalent, or a high-level historically correct set of rules, as you would expect with BBNB. If you were not so worried about historical detail, but were more focused on playability, then Blucher would be an ideal choice. Finally, you can end up with a very abstract, chess-like, highly playable game such as DBN. All these options have advantages and disadvantages, and, and they're really dependent on uh, a player's preference. I actually range uh, with the, the both ends, like DBN, abstract, chess-like game. I can really see the advantage in that, and I certainly do play those games. And flipping way over onto the historically accurate but high level rules such as BBNB where you can actually get a more historical game at a high level but still achieve a certain level of playability. I will also look at Blucher because I think that probably fits somewhere in between. Um, less historical but still retaining quite a great deal of playability. Let's drill down a little bit more detail in terms of the rules. BBNB probably gives you the best high-level historically accurate game, both from the point of the view of the formation and the results. So, if what you want is a set of rules that duplicates as close as possible a historical event and allows you the necessary, um, you know, built into the game mechanics to allow you to build comparatively historically accurate formations and get a reasonable result, as well as being reasonably playable, these are probably the rules that you would gravitate towards. Belushi is a bit of an odd case. It does give you a strong feeling of historical accuracy, but in reality its main focus is playability and there are a lot of historical issues if that's your main focus. It has a very board game feel to it, but does allow you to complete a game in a reasonable time frame, but don't expect this to be let's say historically accurate in terms of duplicating an entire battle, you will get some level of historical accuracy in terms of the counters, how they sort of match up with each other. But, you know, if you're going down the Blucher path, you're not mainly focused on a high level set of rules that will duplicate a historical battle. You're interested in a game. And in that, as far as I can work out, it achieves that extremely well. Rules such as WRG can give you a lot of tactical detail and accuracy, but to refight Marengo you would have to make the game, well the game would be basically unplayable. Unless you have teams of players per side, and even then I would expect it to take several days. These rules probably would give you, or the same uh, similar rules like it in terms of scale, would give you a very detailed historically accurate game right down to a fine grain but you're simply never going to be able to refight a whole battle. You're only going to be refighting a very small part of it. And look, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, and I certainly enjoyed uh, these rules when I used to play them, but it's not my main focus at the present moment. Finally, we move to DBN, which, like Blucher, can give you the feeling that they're reproducing a historical conflict, conflict, but in reality, these are rules are best played with abstract forces which in which case it gives you a very good short and playable game. I would not use these rules to recreate a whole battle uh, or a historical battle except in a very abstract manner. The only time I've ever seen them used in that manner um, is basically with teams, you know, um, four people each side, each commanding let's say a core and doing their own thing on their own two by two foot area. I am uncertain if you can actually use these rules to reproduce, let's say, Waterloo in any kind of realistic manner. I could be wrong, and it's something I need to test, but I don't think that's really the strength. These rules are all about short, sharp, quick, good games, abstract, even forces, and quite frankly, um, I like the rules, 
and they give me a very good game, but it's not. I don't play these rules for historical accuracy. I can tell you that now. You know, when we talk about historical scenarios uh, in the area of micro armor, World War II moderns, historical scenarios are very common, and there are many reasons for this, probably to do with the nature of the rules and the complexity of the situation. When we go to ancients, uh, historical battles are, are fairly rare. I mean, if you look at lost battles, uh, Philip Sabins, that's mainly focused on recreating historical battles. But most of the common ancient rules are all about abstract forces or even forces meeting each other, and you know you slog it out in a chess-like form. Napoleonics is in a very odd grey area where you can do some historical fighting and some abstract fighting. And the issue is that refighting a historical scenario is highly problematic when using figures, except, you know, when you're trying to do some kind of demonstration game. Now, I'm not quite sure why that's the case. I think probably a lot of it has to do with the type of rules. I mean, again, BBNB does a reasonably good job, but it's a fairly high-level abstract. Board games do a very good job of recreating actual battles with custom victory condition, custom units, custom everything. But figure gaming doesn't actually uh, is not board gaming, and figure gaming really sort of moves you towards a more gamey based path where abstract forces meet and fight it out using standard victory conditions. Now, my only thought on this is that possibly if you're interested in Napoleonics, you know, what really gets you into the hobby is, you know, the mighty cuirassiers or hussars or whatever um, all lined up or the infantry all lined up. It's the look of the, the men. So you're very looking at it from a very low level scale. Um, and that's possibly why you end up playing games which are more game-like rather, rather than historical. Once again... Rules such as BBNB may be the exception because it tends to be more focused on trying to reproduce a historical campaign, but at a very high level. And unlike uh, rules such as Blucher or other rules like that, they manage to avoid uh, giving you too much of a board game feel, which is which could be a bit of a, a, an outlier set of rules. But anyway, it's, it's problematic refighting a historical game. I'm not sure if that's really what players um, really want to in their heart, they just want to move their cuirassiers around and uh, say that their cuirassiers beat the other guy's cuirassiers in some sort of equal conflict. Now, of course, uh, if you go to the other end, that is, let's ignore historical scenarios and go to a chess-like game. Okay, DBN does it, it's good, but it also kind of has um, an issue with uh, many players. Um, it has its place at that end, and I completely support it and play it. But most players, even though they want to move around their cuirassiers and dragoons and really look at it at that level, do want to have at least the feeling that you're reproducing a historical battle. And, you know, Blucher, for example, does a reasonably good job at that. However, I think actually there is a better middle ground. I personally feel that you can actually create a more generic scenario with equal forces and some spinning at the beginning to determine who the attacker is, who the defender is, and for if you're the defender, have 25% of your forces coming as reinforcements at, let's say, halfway point of the game. Now, the, in addition to that, the attackers are not initially deployed in the playing area. They come onto the playing area, so the defenders get the advantage of selecting the best defensive terrain. Now, the reason why I think this is um, a good basic framework of a scenario is that unless you're using a um, element manoeuvre set of rules such as DBN, where you know it doesn't matter, you can have equal forces starting and, and it's all about the way you manoeuvre your elements. If you're playing a set of rules where it's more a formation based, that is, you know, you assemble your forces on a particular flank and you send them all together to, you know, engage in some large battle, which is which results either a victory or a loss. You know, that's what I think most players want to gravitate towards. Um, you need to give the attacker some incentive to attack. Because what I've found is that if you have a, um, a detailed set of rules in the manner that I've just described, not an element manoeuvre set of rules, then most victory conditions are based on, let's say, some objectives, but mainly on what you've lost. Losses. I mean, the only way you can actually create victory conditions 
is basically losses. And the trouble is once you involve losses, the easiest way to win is make sure you don't lose anything, which ends up with very boring games. Now, if you have a scenario where, let's say in a poly situation, the attacker has a short-term advantage, then there's a real incentive for that attacker to take the objectives. Um, they outnumber the defenders, they can go hell-bet for leather forward, and they can try and get the objectives, and then in the second half, the rest of the defenders' forces arrive, and they just simply have to hold. So there's a bit of an incentive, and of course the defenders, you give them a bit of an incentive to attack through the objective system. So I think that's pro probably a good kind of solution to the problem I've just outlined, which is, um, you know, if you're using a set of rules that uh, is not an element, element maneuver set of rules and victory conditions are based on losses, you end up with a static game. Basically, in summary, whatever kind of scenario you create, a good game should be one where there's a lot of activity occurring at all times. And this is probably why DBN um, is so popular, because it actually achieves this, okay, in a chess-like manner, but it does achieve it. Belushia also, uh, I think, achieves this in, in a sort of a way, although I have heard some players say that there are some problems with forces, you know, taking a good solid defensive position on a corner and just holding out. Um, but generally, I think probably they achieve a fairly good job in this as well. And of course, you know, uh, BBNB achieves this, I assume. Well, actually, I don't know how BBNB achieves this. You would have to use victory conditions, which used objectives for those particular rules. Just a few observations about uh, the Battle of uh, Marengo. You've, you've already heard, you know, my earlier note concerning that um, the quality. I mean, the French has to have some superior quality. And it's not just Napoleon, because the uh, French managed to basically, while being outnumbered significantly, managed to halt the Austrians in their first position and allowed Napoleon to come up with the consular guards to save the day at the last moment. So there has to be, you know, basically a quality advantage on the French side right down to the, at least to the sub-commander level, if not the units itself. Okay, that's fair enough, and I think most people would probably agree with that. The next observation I made is troop density. The front line at about 1400 hours was no more than four kilometres long. There were some units on the far flanks, but these were fairly minor little skirmishes. The Austrian troop de density then must have been more than 5,000 men per kilometre. If we look at our example element count, which I used in my examples earlier, which is 250 men per element and all this sort of stuff, the Austrian army consists of about 50 elements, 51 elements to be exact, if you include the commanders. At this scale, the ground scale is about 1 5,000. Thus, each kilometre represents 20 centimetres on the playing area, which means 12 elements need to fit in 20 centimetres. This means the average depth of the line is two to three elements. No big issue, but it is reasonably high density. The French density is less, but still reasonable, around about two, one to two. In one account um, of the battle, the French held the Austrian back with one division, and when it was exhausted, another took its place. This implies the divisions were lined up behind each other. I do see this at double lines on many maps of Napoleonic battles. I have no specific conclusion, but that particular point is of interest. But I suppose what I'm really trying to get to here is that the first part of the battle here, you know, is um, basically four kilometres, which means it's 80 centimetres wide, which is not a particularly wide battlefield. And the troop density is actually significantly high, no matter what kind of rules you use. My next observation is the actual length of the battles, that is the part of the battles where there was a lot of conflict. Now, Marengo actually consists of two separate battles, the initial battle where the Austrians defeated the French, and of course the second battle where the French defeated the Austrians. While I lack exact details of the second stage of the battle, it seemed each part of the battle, that is where you know the, the troops all lined up and they started banging away at each other and launching attacks, this lasted from between two to four hours. In the first stage, uh, this, this lasted between 1,100 hours to 1,400 hours, and the second stage from 1,700 to 1,900 hours. 
In the first accounts, the French did a very good job defending. In the second stage of the battle, the Austrians probably did not do as good a job defending. Uh, well, this of course made it, uh, you know, considering they lost their commander in chief, that was, you know, possibly one reason why they collapsed. I will analyse other battles, but if correct, a typical encounter where, you know, someone ends up retreating could last from between two to four hours, which does not include the deployment time. I wonder how many sets of rules reflect this. Something for me to study in more detail. I must admit, some of the later big battles, such as Battle of Nations, um, lasted for a hell of a lot longer. But then on the other hand, the size of those conflicts was significantly larger. And as a result, troops could go in, get defeated, come back, and there were new troops to come in to replace the front line. So I suppose they could maintain uh, themselves longer. Anyway, it's interesting. If we um, talk about four hours as a battle, uh, assuming when both sides are all lined up, with a 30-minute game turn, uh, then we're looking at eight game turns. If we include the deployment turn uh, period, that is, you know, to allow your attackers to come on the playing area, assuming my scenario that I mentioned earlier, we're looking at a game which should last probably no more than 12 game turns, or at a very maximum, um, maybe 15 game turns. That's using a 30-minute game turn length. Um, Interesting observation, which uh, I will certainly take to note um, as I continue to playtest my set of rules and look at other rules. This completes my video on this subject. I will leave it up to an enthusiastic gamer to actually create a scenario from this battle. I have done this um, as part of my playtesting process for my personal attempt at a set of rules, but this is only to ensure that uh, the rules that I'm developing duplicate history to, you know, to ensure that the rules aren't completely ludicrous. Denken Sie daran, immer verhehlen, Heimatland zu kampfen.